Welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and my pronouns are she, her. In this episode, we'll discuss the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, also known as Lectionary 12 or Proper 7, which this year falls on June 25th. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. Our deep dive for today, because of our Hebrew scriptures reading, is on Jeremiah, both the prophet and the book, because we realized that we haven't actually talked much about the major prophets, and, you know, they're the major prophets. We (laughs) should probably talk about them sometimes. I mean, I guess. So, yeah. So Jeremiah the prophet, the person, lived from around 650 to 570 BCE, and he was not, as you might imagine, actually a bullfrog, although I'm sure that many pet bullfrogs have been named Jeremiah in the days since. But he was very often called the weeping prophet, and still is, because he is just very sad a lot of the time. Although, as Emily and I have commented quite a bit when we've talked about Jeremiah before, he also kind of yells a lot. You know, sometimes you get that kind of sad where you yell a lot and you can't really blame him because he went through some stuff yeah I actually when it comes to like Jeremiah as the weeping prophet I think of in the brave little toaster when it looks like their beloved master's car is just like driving by and not coming back for them and Blanky just has this like woe is me moment like that rivals some of Jeremiah's woe is me moments times where it's just like everything's wrong and awful and yeah so that's that's like a lot of how i think about jeremiah (laughs) it does explain a lot and Mm -hmm. jewish tradition says that jeremiah the prophet wrote the books of jeremiah oddly enough well Christians now call First and Second Kings, which the Jewish people would just call the Book of Kings, Mm -hmm. and Lamentations. Indeed. And apparently, Jeremiah only started writing down his visions and prophecies towards the end of his life. So it wasn't done as he was having them. Yeah, that might have been a different take on things. You tend to write things differently when you're looking back on your life than as you go. Mm -hmm. Especially considering how many times people were plotting to kill him. Because he, as God's prophet, threatened their power and comfort because he told the truth about things that they did not want people to know. And so within that, then God rescues Jeremiah multiple times, while also like Jeremiah's work for God is what imperils him in the first place. So it's a little bit of a like, Uh, yeah, cyclical thing. But if God throws you into the firing pan, then God will probably also get you out. Just ask Jonah? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And Jeremiah was descended from and sympathetic to the Israelites in the northern kingdom, which at this point was known as Samaria. And so whenever he references them, it's with warmth and care. And he was active in his prophetic life over the course of six different kings of Israel from Josiah until after the exile and destruction of the first temple. So that's a huge time span for a prophet to be prophesizing, prophetizing, profiting, Mm. prophesying, prophesying (laughs) for like any of the prophets, but then to have like this whole breadth. I think it's particularly interesting that Jeremiah is like from predicting the exile right and like prophesying about the exile because of the way that the inner workings of israel were not lining up with their covenant with god all the way through to the destruction of the first temple and there's just like so much that happens yeah and when we talk about the exile in the bible nine times out of ten and especially during this episode we are talking about the babylonian exile because Mm -hmm. there are a few exiles in the bible and (laughs) This one is the Babylonian exile. Mm -hmm. Which we did a deep dive into in Advent this year, so we'll link to that. Yes, and this continues to prove my Hebrew professor's point that nine times out of ten, if you don't know what a Hebrew Bible answer 
is to a question, just guess the Babylonian exile and you'll have a decent shot at being right. <laughs> Jeremiah's life as a prophet also has some interesting parallels with Moses, including the length of their careers as prophets, both about 40 years. They went through some similar trials and they said some fairly similar things over the years. And these similarities are detailed in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18. And, okay, so Jeremiah was very sad, and Jeremiah <laughs> yelled a lot. What was it that he was yelling about all that time? Well, basically, Israel had been wavering from only worshiping God and starting to offer sacrifices to Baal, the god of a neighboring kingdom. And King Josiah, who was king when Jeremiah started to prophesy in the first place, did put in an effort of trying to put Israel onto a path of repentance. But when he died, the following kings really did not continue that effort. And Jeremiah cites this worship of foreign gods, not just Baal, but largely Baal is my understanding, mm -hmm. as the reason why the Babylonian exile happened, mm -hmm. specifically because they had the chance and opportunity to repent. Jeremiah kept yelling at them for a very long time, and they did not. Well, and I think this is also where the connection is for Jeremiah and why people consider Jeremiah to be Deuteronomistic, which is a big long word for within the scope of the book of Deuteronomy and what Deuteronomy is talking about. So it, Deuteronomy is both the result of and part of reforms that happened, right? And so King Josiah yes. is part of that and calling people to reform to return to stuff. That's why the Ten Commandments are a little bit different in Exodus versus Deuteronomy. And so Jeremiah is thought to be probably part of that, part of those reforms and that call back to the covenant with God. Yeah. So that brings us to the actual book of Jeremiah and its composition history. So this moves out of the like historical person who is Jeremiah and into the book made up of the memories of the prophesying of the prophet Jeremiah. Yes. So this is partly like a reminder. The Bible was written by humans. And m throughout most of human history, we have relied on oral traditions to pass things along. And so things don't get written down right away. So things get tweaked and shifted and sure. adjusted to meet the context. Like, do we believe that God was involved in the writing of the Bible? Absolutely. But inspiration does not mean being a spell check. Exactly. Yeah. God has better things to do. <laughs> exactly. So the composition history, there are two main sources for fairly complete versions of Jeremiah. One is from the Septuagint, which is the name of a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Sometimes the like shorthand of it is LXX because of because of some legends. It's like supposedly 70 people translated yes. the Septuagint from Hebrew to Greek and they all translated it exactly the same. Right. And so LXX is simply the Roman numeral for 70, mm -hmm. which is a throwback to the tradition. Yeah. And Septuagint, Septu, Sept is also related right. to that. So this is the version that is used in the earliest Christian manuscripts. And actually, this is thought to be from the 3rd century BCE. So the Hebrew underlying this Greek translation is thought to be the oldest version. There is another version that was discovered but it's not complete. And so you just get like tidbits here, tidbits here, tidbits here. And sure. it actually matches neither the Septuagint version nor what we'll talk about after is the Masoretic Hebrew text. So there's been a lot yeah. of different versions of this text, of this book, depending. And quite often when you notice that the New Testament is quoting the Hebrew scriptures and they seem to get a word wrong here or there, it's because they're actually quoting the Greek version and not the Hebrew version. Mm -hmm. Matthew does this all the time. We've talked about it yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. So the Septuagint was used in the earliest Christian manuscripts, although at this point, I think most Bibles use the Masoretic Hebrew structure. But the 
Septuagint is a little bit shorter. It's missing the last chapter of Jeremiah, and the order is swapped. So it swaps what is called the oracles against the foreign nations, which is just proclamations of divine judgment and punishment against nations that are not Israel. So that in the Septuagint happens as like the middle of three main parts of Jeremiah. And then the scribal anthology, so the biographic material and the listing of like the scribes who were prominent, as well as God's promises for Israel, which in the Septuagint version comes at the end. So those get swapped for the Masoretic Hebrew order. Those are reversed so that the oracles against the nations come last. And so the Septuagint pattern and structure actually more closely matches the structure for Ezekiel and Isaiah and aligns Jeremiah with Israel's tradition of prophets and wraps up the fate of other nations with that of Israel by putting that in the middle instead of at the end. So there, there's a lot of like really cool stuff that happens with the Septuagint that we then don't get because that's not the version that we have nowadays in scripture. Yeah. So on the one hand, you have the Greek Septuagint. On the other hand, you have the Masoretic Hebrew version of the text. Masoretic just means that the notes for the vowels are included in the Hebrew text. Many of you may know that the Hebrew alphabet doesn't really do vowels the way that, say, English or, for that matter, Greek does. And that is true of the truly ancient Hebrew texts. But as time went on, they developed a method of notating vowel sounds in the text without actually disturbing the original ancient Hebrew. And this is called Masoretic Hebrew. And that was used in traditional Jewish Bibles. And this is also where we get the structure for the book of Jeremiah that ended up being used today in Christian Bibles as well. Mm -hmm. Basically, when Emily said that the Septuagint switched things around, the Christian Bible we have today has switched them back Mm -hmm. to the way they were originally. And the Masoretic text that we have, the oldest copies, go back to the 9th century CE, which is not actually super ancient when you think about it. (laughs) Not in the realm of like biblical scripture. Yeah, or, you know, ancient Egyptian stuff that we have these days. And the Hebrew that the Septuagint was translated from originally would have been much older than this. But like I said, when they created the Masoretic text, they did put quite a bit of effort into not disturbing the original text. They just added the vowels as Mm -hmm. the vowels look a lot like we would think of as apostrophes or umlauts or things like that. They're notes above and below Mm-hmm. the regular letters and, that don't disturb the original text. And most of us who learn biblical Hebrew in seminary or something like that, I learned it in college, learn it with the vowels because it's yes. just easier. But modern Hebrew does not include the vowels. So if you're like right. in the Middle East, probably not. Yeah, you won't see those. So what about the structure of the book of Jeremiah? Well, the first chunk that we get, chapters 1 through 25, that is the earliest and main core of Jeremiah's message. Basically, if you want to know what Jeremiah really thought about the world, by golly, chapters 1 through 25 will tell you all about it at great length and with a certain Mm -hmm. amount of yelling, as we have mentioned before. And then after that, you start getting the smaller sections, chapter 26 through 29, you get some biographical material about Jeremiah and also his interaction with the scribes of Israel. And we'll get more into his relationship with the scribes later. Mm -hmm. And then in chapters 30 to 33, we get God's promise of restoration, including Jeremiah's new covenant, which is interpreted very differently in Judaism than it is in Christianity. Oh, yeah. But this part is Actually, I think beginning at 29 is some of the more well-loved and oft-quoted passages and verses from Jeremiah. All those Jeremiah texts you get at Christmas, all of them are from that section. Yeah, (laughs) which makes sense because... It's this one very small, warm and fuzzy chunk of Jeremiah. And by golly, we love that so much. (laughs) Yep. And that's like even in the Revised Common Lectionary, and we get this with Isaiah too, the selections and with the Psalms, actually. I mean, with the Bible in general. Yeah. It skews optimistic instead of realistic, Yes, which is not actually helpful for, you know, 
the faith and the reality of Christians, of people, but is kind of a, a decision that was made. We'll just call it that. It was a decision. <laughs> so then after chapter 33, in chapters 34 to 45, is mostly the interaction with Zedekiah and the fall of Jerusalem. So the sending of the people of Israel into the Babylonian exile, the conquest of Babylon, that sort of a thing. Yeah. Zedekiah was the Israelite king at the time, right? Yeah. Yes. And then in chapters 46 to 51 is the divine punishment to the nations surrounding Israel. So this is the oracles against the nations that I mentioned earlier. And that's just a God kind of saying like, okay, I used you because Israel was messing up and not listening. But also what you're doing to Israel is not good. So yeah, stop that. Yeah. And then... Chapter 52 is the part that was not in the Septuagint, but is in the versions that we use today and the Masoretic text. And so you can kind of think of it as an appendix, but it is an appendix that retells Second Kings or the second part of the Book of Kings, depending on if you are a Christian or Jewish. And it was probably added later, kind of like the ending of Mark, but a little bit maybe more legit. <laughs> the ending of Mark, yeah. the extra endings. Of so, so that's the part where when you said that the Septuagint was a little shorter than the original Jewish part, this was the bit that was left out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't a whole bunch shorter. It was like an eighth of the book shorter. So there might have been some other stuff, but this was definitely the like main thing that got left out. Sure. And then what are the major themes? So okay, kind of give like a historical overview of like what time period and that sort of thing. But then... There are some major themes within the like big picture of the threat of exile into foreign lands and the status of the ancestral homeland that come into play. It's interesting how much really is connected to land and location. And I think that is really important to think about and to be aware of because particularly like from a U.S. Christian perspective. So much of Christianity has been displacing people from their lands, whether it's yes. kidnapping, enslaving, and trafficking people from the continent of Africa, or attempts at genocide and removal of Native people from their communities and their cultures, to then like go back to Jeremiah that is like so much about like the value and the importance of ancestral homelands, of the land where we yeah. gather, I think helps push against those parts of Christianity that are so colonial and so violent and so harmful. Yeah. So the first kind of biggest theme in Jeremiah, hence the yelling and such, is transgression and <laughs> punishment. So, so much of Jeremiah centers on Israel's transgressions against God, the ways that Israel has broken the covenant with God, has messed up, has caused harm, has done injustice, and then the consequences of that, of God's judgment and then punishment. Yeah. But then in reflection of that, you also have the themes of repentance and redemption, particularly in what's called the Book of Comfort, which is that Jeremiah chapter 30 through 33 section that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. that talks about the covenant. And this section is divine proclamations or oracles of woe and judgment. They also have provisions for redemption and restoration throughout. Jeremiah always states that there's a way out, a way back, a path to redemption. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's so important to, right? Like, that's part of what gets misinterpreted in Christianity some, but that's such an integral part of the relationship that the Israelites have with God is that God comes back and is like, okay, but there are ways to repent. There are ways yes. to come back. Right. So, and related to that is the themes of law and covenant, which is that Israel and God's covenant is central throughout the book and is always assumed to continue. Like mm -hmm. Jeremiah never claims that the covenant is going to come to an end. Israel may have screwed some things <laughs> up and broken it for a while, but there is always a path to, to fixing it. And mm -hmm. there is no expectation that Israel would just completely abandon it. Yeah. And as part of that, there are references to legal concepts that lend 
a, to a account based thoroughly in the covenant that God makes with Israel in Deuteronomy. Again, very Deuteronomistic as a theme. Mm-hmm. And that continues through the book. But also, along with that, you get the themes of Baal and falsehood. Baal, that neighboring kingdom's god, and falsehood reflect each other. Sometimes in the book of Jeremiah, the word Baal is referencing the Canaanite deity, that neighboring kingdom, and the idolatry of icons or gods that might include sexual acts, as historically we're aware. But also, when you worship multiple gods and you start comparing God that is Elohim, to them for long enough, you can sort of wind up using God's name to actually mean or worship other gods. Like they all kind of start getting a little mixed up after a while. What this reminds me of is in the movie A Fish Called Wanda, Kevin Klein's character on the one hand is very interested in and has extensively studied the religion of Buddhism. On the other hand, he is not very bright and does not comprehend a lot of very basic concepts in Buddhism. And so what he winds up calling Buddhism is pretty much exactly the opposite of actual Buddhism. Mm. And throughout the movie, multiple people point that out to him in various increasingly impolite ways. But when you start mixing up your gods like that, that kind of thing can happen. And that's what God is worried about. That's kind of like what happens in the Broadway musical, The Book of Mormon, too. For those I've heard that, yes. it. it is definitely a not suitable for work kind of musical. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Also, the other theme that kind of goes with this is the idea of the divine word, God's word, which is in complete opposition to these falsehoods and the concepts of Baal, not just as like the other deity, but the concept of idolatry, of icons and that sort of a thing. And throughout Jeremiah, the language that is used for God. So there are kind of two main ways that especially Hebrew scriptures talk about God. One is Elohim, as Kay said, and that is translated as God. And so that shows up whenever you see the word Lord, particularly in all caps, that actually is referring to the proper name of God, the what we call the Tetragrammaton, which is yod Hey vav Hey. We are not naming it, saying it, pronouncing it, because within Judaism, you don't do that out of respect for God and out of an abundance of caution so as not to use God's name in vain, so as not to misuse God's name. So, but throughout Jeremiah, that is the word that is used. So we're talking about God and we're using God because Lord is not actually the name of God. It's a kind of replacement and it has its own like patriarchal, hierarchical hangups that are not in the actual name of God. And so we're just using God for that. But just so you know, as you dig into Jeremiah, when Lord comes up, that's what we're actually referring to. I'll translate it usually instead of Lord, I'll say everlasting, or I know people that translate it as the becoming one or that sort of thing. Sure. There's some flexibility there. But yeah, so the divine word, the everlasting's word is set up in opposition and as counter to the falsehoods and the concepts of Baal that Kay mentioned. And then the other major theme that is unique to Jeremiah in particular and probably comes about connected to when Jeremiah existed and the time period when Jeremiah was written and that sort of thing is the prominence of scribes. And a lot of the information that we have for this deep dive like we get it and we'll link to some of the places wikipedia for all that it is not like officially a legit source for academics it is pretty good for a lot of biblical stuff not all biblical stuff but for stuff like jeremiah you can always check wikipedia for some of the basics but we also used an article which is unfortunately behind a paywall unless your library can grant you access, which there are a lot of libraries throughout the country who have subscriptions to academic journals and that sort of thing so that patrons of those libraries have access to that stuff. But the article is called Jeremiah Structure Themes and Contested Issues by Mark Luchter. And it's from the Oxford Handbook of the Prophets, which is edited by Carolyn J. Sharp. 
So we can't give you a link to get that for free, but your library might be able to help you get that for free if you want to dig deeper into that article. So what the article talks about for the prominence of scribes is that while scribes are key to all the prophetic books, right? They're the ones who write stuff down. Jeremiah actually emphasizes the role and names the scribes and the scribes have the role of protecting Jeremiah, spreading the message that Jeremiah is proclaiming, and guarding that message later. So there's this shift that's happening during the time of Jeremiah getting written down where scribes are becoming more prominent. And some people talk about Jeremiah and say that the people named are prophets. They're actually scribes. And so what this article talks about is that the line between prophecy and scribalism, the extolling and uplifting of scribes, is blurred, if not ultimately removed throughout the book of Jeremiah. So it's in this time period where we're moving from prophecy and prophets being more regular to scribes and the writing down of the prophecies and the like creation of scrolls and eventually codexes and books to keep track of that right. stuff. And my understanding is that the difference between the prophets and the scribes is that the prophets spoke for God and often said some very unpopular things, and the scribes were more along the lines of scholars and bureaucrats, and they knew a lot of stuff, and they wrote everything <laughs> down. But it wasn't really their job to say the unpopular thing. Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily being spoken to directly by God. Yeah. I think a lot of times, too, if we think about scribes not as lawyers, but as like the legal aids and stuff, right? The ones taking notes. Sure. The ones writing everything down. And then there are a few more hotly contested, given that it's academics, issues that come up in the book oh, of I've Jeremiah. Oh, I've seen academics too. get just as yelly as Jeremiah. That's fair. Yeah. But. Yeah. So the main four kind of hotly contested issues are Jeremiah, the like whole corpus, the whole body of Jeremiah works as a source for historical reconstruction. So there's some debate of if Jeremiah can be a reliable source of like, these were the kings and the orders in which they were king. And this is like historical fact, which is something that comes up a lot in the Bible. Like the Bible for the most part was not written to be a historical factual accounting. It was written to tell the story of people's relationship with the divine. So that's a contested issue. There's also the relationship between the Jeremiah Corpus, the body of Jeremiah, and the Deuteronomistic tradition is contested. So we talked about it as like Jeremiah is part of the Deuteronomistic reforms, the reforms connected to the book of Deuteronomy, but that's contested. Not everybody believes that. Not everybody is on board with that as part and parcel or as connected as a kind of I portrayed it to be. Yeah. That's my particular perspective coming through. And then there's also the concepts of poetry versus prose in the oracles is very much connected to the controversy around whether or not Jeremiah fits within the Deuteronomistic tradition. Because right. depending on if you're like emphasizing the prose or emphasizing the poetry or valuing one or the, over the other impacts, which is more Deuteronomistic and which is less in the similar reverse way. If you are thinking Jeremiah is more Deuteronomistic, that'll impact how you think about prose versus poetry in the divine proclamations. Right. And then the final kind of hotly contested issue is the text critical study of the many different versions of Jeremiah. So text critical is looking at the text and critiquing it. And so that's which version is older, which version is better, and that gets into the dynamics with the Septuagint, the Masoretic Hebrew text, and the other older one that is incomplete and so just has like snippets from it. And to be fair, that's a hotly contested issue for pretty much every single book of the Bible. So that's true. It's not just Jeremiah. That's true. Yeah. Jeremiah is one that we have two fairly complete versions of that conflict in. Yes order in some like big things noticeable ways. and noticeable ways and that's why it comes out maybe more for jeremiah than for other books of the bible also jeremiah is quoted a lot in the new testament especially in the book of matthew 
and in Revelation. So we get both Jeremiah, the book, and like the book of Lamentations and other sources that are attributed to the prophet Jeremiah. Yeah. And so as we jump into our Nerds at Church pop culture segment, where are the prophets or especially the angry prophets in pop culture, especially because I've already made the bullfrog joke <laughs> at the start of our deep dive? Mm-hmm. Well, lots of apocalyptic stories especially have prophets on street corners declaring the end. Often these guys, and they're really almost always guys, like I can't actually think of any women or any people with other genders. Like that's not a, Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let women be angry prophets, folks. Yeah. But <laughs> not for lack of actual women, to be clear, we are not the SBC, as is evidenced by our podcast of two pastors, neither of whom are men. Yes. If you want to yell about God's word, by golly, you go out and do yeah. it no matter what gender you are. <laughs> oh, but Yeah, so lots of apocalyptic stories have prophets on street corners declaring the end of the world, the end has come. Often they are wearing a sandwich board or they have draped a bedsheet over themselves to look sort of like a robe without having to spend a lot of money on one. And you'll find this in movies like 2012 and Independence Day. Yeah, and this is not, I mean, I guess it is. It's modeled after contemporary street corner doomsdayers but yeah we're just pretty sure that if the world did actually end those guys would keep doing their thing (laughs) yeah and there's a lot of attempts to calculate the end times which as we talked about in our deep dive on the book of revelation is made up yes the bible just tells us not to do that folks. yeah the bible says not to do it and the book of revelation gets really misinterpreted in order to make up those calculations and claim that there is some sort of like end times as is depicted in pop culture. Yeah. Also, I thought about Jeremiah and pop culture and like, I mean, aside from Blanky and (laughs) the Brave Little Toaster, but the role of a troubadour, which I mostly know from Gilmore Girls, Mm. is like this person who stands on the street corner and he, like the main troubadour, plays his guitar and sings about stuff that is relevant to the people in the community and to what's happening in the episode. And so And the fact that he also has a long beard and the long hair to go with it that just sort of suit the thing. Right, yeah. like it, it just goes with it. And there ends up being a whole episode on troubadours invading the town because the guy gets a big break. But I like that like that's the kind of feel that I have for Jeremiah. It's not Ah, everything's awful and the end of the world is coming. Like, yeah, sometimes he says that, but it's not because he's made it up. It's like contextualized in his context, in the community that he's in, yeah. in Jerusalem. And then the other one that I thought of was Toby from West Wing towards the end of the last season when he becomes the prophetic whistleblower. Like Toby just has major Jeremiah feels right like he's melancholy and morose a lot and also yells at people but like his particular place of being the whistleblower about the extra space shuttle that could save the lives of those who are on the space station feels very jeremiah right like it is risking a lot for the sake of what is right and he doesn't do it with like a smile on his face he does it knowing that this sucks knowing that this stinks and that this is hard and that it's not going to be great basically and ultimately speaking he does it because he cares Mm -hmm. despite the fact that he would rather probably die than admit that and now as we dive into our reading surprise surprise our first reading is from the book of jeremiah who was not a bullfrog (laughs) correct who is not a bullfrog but is a little bit like Blanky and Toby. Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. While Jeremiah has apparently become a laughingstock in the process of being God's prophet, he has not lost his faith that God will ultimately prevail. So one of the themes in this passage is the idea that God will rescue Jeremiah. And the way it's phrased and the way I was thinking about it, I was like, it's kind of like Buffy. Frequently, she like, comes to the rescue of random humans in back alleyways because they're being attacked by vampires. Absolutely. But yeah, that God will come to Jeremiah's rescue in a similar way. Yeah. And in the second part of verse seven, we read, I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. 
That's Jeremiah talking about himself, by the way. Mm -hmm. And if you actually feel like this in real life, Brene Brown's book, Rising Strong, may actually be helpful for you. It was a much needed reframing for me of how I understood the world and my place in it and how like the world worked mm -hmm. after my first call ended. And it is a great guide to picking up and moving on after a hard failure. Yeah. So I really appreciated it. Yeah. And then in verse nine, Jeremiah says, if I say... I will not mention God or speak any more God's name. Then within me, there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in and I cannot. And I was so struck by the description of like a burning fire shut up in my bones that it sounds like from what I have heard from people with fibromyalgia, it sounds like fibromyalgia that like yeah. everything is on fire, like or body is on fire. There's a handful of autoimmune conditions, but fibromyalgia is one of them that definitely has that as a symptom. I know a few people with autoimmune conditions that do that. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's very evocative. It, very, it definitely gets the message across. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Also, imagine being able to cure fibromyalgia just by speaking God's word. That's right. Amazing. Hmm. That would be helpful. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hint, hint. God. <laughs> and then in verse 11, we read, but the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. And I don't have screens in my sanctuary, so I personally won't be able to do this on this Sunday. But please tell me that someone somewhere is going to have the meme from Mulan saying, dishonor on your cow during this <laughs> bit of the reading up on a screen somewhere, because that needs to happen. Like, if you want the church to continue having a relationship with Generation Z and Alpha, this is how you do it. So. <laughs> And millennials. Let's be real. Millennials. Well, yeah. No, the millennials Mulan. will completely be on board too. Yeah. Yes. The memes will catch a bunch. Mulan in particular will catch millennials. Yeah. yeah. And then in verse 12, we read, O oh, everlasting of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you, I have committed my cause. And this reaction, we actually get it a fair amount in the Bible of like, God punish them. God, do these terrible things to them. God, ah. And it's this like the human's worst desires, right? That part of this is the trust that God knows better than us and God maybe won't, you know, cause violent harm to people. Yeah. But it also reminds me of like the best example that I have is like Doctor Who with the Silurians, which are the like lizard people that have been in hibernation. And like the humans sure. immediate reaction to them is fear and like wanting to destroy them. That's automatically yeah. and so frequently that's like our human reaction is to especially in any sort of sci fi fantasy dystopia. Like alien invasion, ah, they're gonna kill us, so we gotta kill them first, kind of thing. And it's like, okay. This is, this is like doctor being like, okay, you can say that, but like, let's not. And unfortunately some Silurians yeah. do get killed in that, but yeah, I like the temperance of like a human's gut reaction of fear and violence is tempered because there's an intervener called, you know, God. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say regarding this verse and your earlier comments on it before we got to the Silurians. I kind of understand the urge to ask God to, you know, wreak havoc on my enemies. Like, mm -hmm. I've emotionally speaking been there. Oh, yeah. And those comments in the Bible don't necessarily disturb me. But every so often, there are a couple spots in the Bible where people get real specific about what they want God to do to other people. <laughs> or and that gets babies. deeply weird and unsettling. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, those are actually two different things. And here it's just, you know, general retribution and anger. And that's understandable. And in other places, it's really specific things that make you wonder what the heck is going on. But yeah. Which also, like, I'd rather you ask God to do it than you try and do it yourself. All of the absolutely, like, all of the people who are like, God wants this to happen. And that's why I'm doing it. I'm like, if God wanted it to happen, it would be happening. Yeah. Without your input. Yeah. And that doesn't go all the ways, but like when it comes to violence, I feel like God doesn't need our help with that. No. In yeah. fact, we have tried to help God too much with that. And God's like, no, stop. Absolutely. The goal is not to do this. <laughs> yes. Our second reading for this episode is from Romans chapter six, verses one B through 11. 
Paul explains that our baptism frees us, not for sinning as we like, but instead from sin's ultimate consequences. So I was reading this, and this is a passage that we read a lot, or that we get a lot, that's like, or that I like quote a lot, of like, united to Christ in death so that we can be united in the resurrection, all of that. I mean, it is like half of our funeral liturgy, so. It's true. But this time that I read it, I was just like, this almost feels like conscription. Like, I've always thought about it as like, joining like into the body of Christ becoming a part of this but this felt like conscription like we are joining up and I don't have a non-military analogy for it which is unfortunate but it then also felt a lot like River and Simon Tan in Firefly when they join up with the Serenity crew like there are moments where they get like particularly ingrained in the crew but there's an initial like all right we're casting our lots together we're saying we're in it for death or life together which i yeah i like that i like that idea of like okay my fate is tied up in jesus fate which is tied up in the fate of literally everyone and all of creation yeah absolutely and then the first verse which we get the second half of it i don't know why they cut out the first half because the first half is fine but paul questions should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound and Paul's answer is no but it reminds me of Martin Luther's call to like sin boldly and he wasn't talking about quite like this this was not quite what he was talking about but more like the Firefly crew where like they because they are not a legal crew they have some freedom to do illegal things while doing their best to be moral. They still have the wrestling with like when they do immoral things or that sort of thing, but they don't have to worry about being perfectly legal and perfectly moral if they are doing their best because there is grace in that space of like, you are trying your best in a world that is in a universe that is complicated and that you can't actually be completely 100% ethical and moral the entire time and actually live. Yeah, because the Firefly crew's alignment is essentially neutral good. Although sometimes they Mm -hmm. lean a little bit more neutral neutral, but still. Yeah. And then in verse 3 we read, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Okay, so the linking of baptism and death may sound weird to a lot of us, especially if you haven't spent a lot of your life listening to or participating in the Lutheran funeral liturgy, because (laughs) we lean pretty heavy on that. Mm -hmm. But it's a connection made in the very earliest church days. And, you know, the days when the Bible was actually still being written. And back then, infant mortality and death and childbirth were much more common. And so this link of baptism and death made a lot more instinctual sense for folks. But If you're looking for an interesting twist on this link, Russell Crowe has a band and they do a song called Testify that puts an interesting twist on this link between baptism and death that I personally find pretty entertaining. So we'll include a link to that in the show notes. I did not know that he had a band. It's called The Ordinary Fear of God. I have honestly no idea what other kind of music they do. I just know about this one song because they played it at the American Film Institute Awards one year Hmm. that I happened to watch. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's a fun song. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 8, we read, But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Now, this does not mean that we will turn into angels. Angels are not just dead people. Angels are their own separate thing, which would explain the, you know, four sets of wings and the lots of eyes and possibly also wheels and various weirdness in their description. (laughs) And there are oodles of options of what a biblically accurate angel might look like out there. And we have some options for you. It's true. And some of those options look a lot like the alien in Nope. I'm just saying. Some of them look a lot like Beholders from D&D. Uh-huh. Yes. For those of you who are listening, which is to say everyone except for Kay, there's a Beholder that my best friend drew on my whiteboard, and my whiteboard is right behind my head. So every once in a while, Kay, I mean, consistently, Kay gets a bunch of eyeballs, <laughs> but every once in a while. Sticking out from your head. Glimpse. Yes. Yeah. Kay gets a glimpse of the Beholder itself. It's my Beholder of chores. Every chore I do, hmm. one of the eyes gets a little arrow pierced in it. Anyway, in verse 9, 
We continue and read, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over them. And I love this idea of death no longer having dominion. And there's a lot of like really practical ways that I think it's helpful. But all I can think about, because I'm reading War Cross right now by Marie Lu, is death not having dominion like in War Cross and video games where like if you die, you're just like 50 yards back and blinky for a little while. <laughs> you might have to go fetch your stuff. Yeah. And I love that. <laughs> And then our gospel reading for today is Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. While the life that Jesus calls us to is not easy and may cause division, even among the people we love, God still loves and values us. So one of the themes in this passage is the idea of value and worth. And, you know, the example given is that we are worth more than many sparrows, but partly I'm like, I mean, you could say we are worth more than an orca, but should we be? Because these orcas, they are <laughs> impressive. If you don't know what is happening with the orcas, you should check it out because they are organizing. <laughs> I did not make that up. I wish I had. It was so good. But like they are organizing because they understand their worth and their value and are working. And that they are worth more than any individual yacht. Yes. And especially any individual yacht's rudder. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, It's a great story. Google it. It is. Yeah. Also, I love the fact that the journalists are starting to sound more and more freaked out by this as time goes on. Yeah. And, <laughs> and watching that is kind of fun. And the like anti capitalists are like, yes, more, <laughs> more. The labor unions are like, be like the orcas. It's fantastic. Yes. I love it. Twitter has just been blessed in the last couple of weeks with that. The memes are amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in verse 26, we read, so have no fear of them for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. Or as X-Files would put it, the truth is out there. <laughs> just ask the SBC, right? Ooh, ooh, ooh. The truth is out there and having a list of secret sexual predators is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Strangely enough, as any lawyer could have told them for crying out loud. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Other truths like the protection of the Indian Child Welfare Act are out there and true and upheld and amazing. Yeah. So, you know, not everything is terrible right now. No, not at all. And then in verse 30, we read, and even the hairs of your head are all counted. And we were watching a comedian the other day, and I don't remember who it was, but they apparently had had like a hair transplant. And they were talking about like, literally, hair transplants are pay per like hair follicle. And so mm -hmm. every hair being added to your head is also counted in that. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading that verse and I thought to myself, look, if you were an eternal omniscient being, you might take up some weird hobbies too to pass the time, right? <laughs> like, at least this is less destructive than the guy in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy who travels through time and space with the goal of insulting every being in the universe in alphabetical order. <laughs> like, this That's this right. seems mildly constructive. It's not maybe super useful, but it's constructive. Yeah. And then in verses 35 and 36, Jesus says, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and in-laws against each other. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. And we're in Pride. This is Pride weekend for us in Baltimore this Sunday. And it just like, there's so much about this particular part of this passage that resonate so deeply as a queer person of like, yeah, bio family get divided. And that is why we have chosen family that like we yeah. create our own family that is not divided, that is united in a purpose of care and love for each other and for the community. And yeah, so this one is always a pretty queer passage. Yeah, absolutely. And now for what is if we're being honest, our yelliest segment on a frequent basis, <laughs> let's make a Muppets musical. Emily, do you have any thoughts on casting people in our readings for this week? I mean, the easiest people to divide 
within a household are Bert and Ernie. Like, the, well, that's true. They they make a great pair and they work together really well. But like, if you want to divide them, it's really easy because they're like the odd couple before the odd couple. They're always like have bickering and stuff. So I don't know. They seem like the example for Jesus of divided family. Sure. I mean, whatever you. Well, I was trying to not exactly cast Jeremiah, but like if Jeremiah was around today, like a modern Jeremiah. Mm. And on the one hand, if Jeremiah is going to go the sandwich board route, like Beaker clearly has the best body for wearing a sandwich board. You can get a <laughs> lot of information on that sandwich board. He's very tall. <laughs> but I don't think he'd be very good at the whole yelly part. Like you could probably give him a bell he could ring, but that would be about it. And uh, meeping just does not really get the thought across in the same way. And what about Oscar the Really, clown? in terms of the the angry and sad thing, that's not really something that the Muppets so much do. So I think Oscar the Grouch may have to come in from Sesame Street to help out with this part. Mm-hmm. He, he's not always sad, but he does get there occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. I would do Oscar for Jeremiah. That would be a good Jeremiah choice. I think sometimes Big Bird is sad, but not yelly. Not yelly. That's the, no. that's the trick is like there's this space of sadness and yelliness and yeah and i think oscar the grouch could probably put the sandwich board around his trash can yeah when you were talking about sandwich board i was like that would work put the sandwich board around the trash can or just like spray paint the trash can it could be yeah, its own yeah absolutely yeah that's true as long as it was oscar spray painting his own trash can like don't graffiti oscar's trash can without his oh, consent that's yeah. not okay yeah thanks for joining us catch us next time when we'll discuss nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the fifth sunday after pentecost this podcast has been produced by us, Emily Ewing and Kay Roloff. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Nerds at Church or contact us at nerdsatchurch at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts. If you want access to our uncut guest episodes and interviews, live Q&As, and more, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerds at church. It's cheaper than angering a bunch of people in authority because they're worried that they're going to lose their comfortable lifestyle and having to go on the run and have God save you from people trying to kill you all the time. It's also cheaper than moving into exile or anywhere. Sure, absolutely. That's true, yeah. Also, let us know on Facebook or Twitter who you would cast for Let's Make a Muppets musical for this episode. As the ancient Christians said, Pox Phobiscum. Phobiscum.